testimonies, our good personal friend, the fine physician, Dr. Peter Michalos. Thank you very, very much. And as we would say in New York City slang in summary, if mama ain't happy, nobody happy. That's a t-shirt I saw in the city one time when I was working out of lecture in Columbia. We want to welcome everyone to this most interesting event sponsored by the Charities Family Foundation. Thank you very much, Kula. Thank you, Father Alex, Constantine, Presbytera, Xanthi, and Anastasia, and our pre church president, our entire church family for making this night possible because we really are a church family and we come together and work together. It's very fitting tonight that we're all standing next to a Greek Orthodox church and a Hellenic cultural center as we speak of health. Many forget that St. Luke was a Greek physician uh, in Syria and that many of our Greek Orthodox saints were physicians and healers. St. Bandeleimo, St. Barbara, Ayer Mioni, and it goes on and on. And a lot of the saints were physicians and healers. And standing next to a Hellenic cultural center, which represents a multi-century history of healing from Hippocrates, the father of medicine, to the prolific medical researcher of antiquity, who was Galen. And interestingly, he was ethnically Greek. And Galen spoke of Aristratus, Aristratus of Chios. So believe it or not, Aristratus of Chios was the first one to say that emotions and mental health don't come from the heart because before that, that was the thinking. And Aristratus of Chios, who was a professor of the, the Harvard of the time, was the University of Alexandria in Egypt, and he studied neuroanatomy. He was the first one to describe an artery and a vein. So he was the first to describe that it comes from the brain and that the brain is the command center for men and women. And he was the first to write about emotions and mental health emanate from the brain. And it was very interesting that uh, this is 300 years before Christ, and his medical school actually went on for 300 years and continued in Zmirna, of all places. And Zmirna is a very interesting place. Um, that's where our recent Supreme Allied Commander of NATO was from Zmirna. His family is here, and we thank him for coming. We also thank our distinguished guests here. We have the Provost of Stony Brook here, which is going to basically be in charge of all of healthcare on the East End of Long Island, so that's a very important that they're here representing and our representatives from our local hospital. So now we fast forward 50 years, and, and we have um, a distinguished Greek physician, Papa Nicolaou, who saved millions of women from the horrors of cervical cancer. And there's been a role in health care and helping women in, in the Greek uh, culture and history. And everyone takes the oath of Hippocrates when they go to medical school. Now fast forward again, and then we have a distinguished psychotherapist in Nitsia Logothetis who trained at Brown University in psychology, the prestigious University of London. She comes to New York. And she realizes that there's a major void in the delivery system of comprehensive women's health issues. And add a supportive, uh, generous husband like George Lobovetis, who's got the heels blood in his veins. That's one of the reasons I'm here. And the Seleni organization is born. And you have to give Nitsia a lot of credit because if she did this in 2011 and she had a two-year-old at home and another baby to assemble the infrastructure to bring all the services that we're about to hear about tonight under one roof is no easy task. And when we talk about Seleni, those of you who've seen the website and description, it's a very interesting history, but basically we'll be talking about a comprehensive center for women's mental wellness that delivers multiple disciplines and specialties needed to address the multifaceted issues of women during times of transitions, for example, pregnancy, trying to get pregnant, postpartum after birth, depression, and that Seleni offers under one roof. And we're going to get into that discussion and we're going to save questions for the end um, of the lecture. Misia and George Logothetis and their team has permitted a centralized coordination and delivery of mental health support services that are otherwise not available through one entry point. And it's very important that uh, people understand that right now we have all these insurance companies or what I call many underinsured people with all these HMOs and the whole referral system of getting people help. Like I've known people with postpartum depression, it's horrible, it affects the entire family. And being able to go to one centralized uh, institute that allows 
that person to get help because it not only affects the woman who's suffering alone sometimes, it also affects the children, the husband, and the entire family. So we're very fortunate to have Ellen Manos here. And uh, she's a very distinguished uh, gynecologist, obstetrician in New York City, a senior attending at uh, Lenox Hill Hospital, a great surgeon, but she's also very knowledgeable about the hormonal issues that women experience. And actually, I was driving home and on satellite radio, she was doing a talk show on this matter, and she did an excellent job. So I'm very happy to hear what she has to tell us about why it's such a tumultuous time for women during the period of pregnancy, birth, after birth, and if you can just give us a little bit of medical insight into what is happening to women during this difficult and challenging period. Absolutely. Um, I think. Uh, Peter said it well when he said that transitions are the key word to all of this changes in a woman's life. Transitions from childhood to adolescence, then to young adulthood. In two generations ago, women were simply transitioning from that point to maybe a high school or a college education, getting married, becoming mothers. Nowadays, for the last two generations at least, the transitions continue. You become a college graduate, you go to graduate school, you become a CEO, or you become a mother and mother. Mm, this is a little, this bit, turn it down a little bit. Uh, a working mother. All these transitions are fraught with um, difficulty, and yet we do it. We do it because we want to do it, Sometimes we do it because we have to do it. When a woman... Excuse me one moment. Um, when a woman decides finally to go ahead and make the plunge into marriage and motherhood, a lot of things come up. And a lot of them are normal anxieties, a lot of them are created anxieties. But once the person is pregnant, and hopefully it becomes an easy thing to do to get pregnant, then the hormonal basis of the changes is out of the woman's control. And this is the part of life that women have to sort of get used to, because the changes in pregnancy, the hormonal changes are incredible. They're there for a reason, but the reason is not about the mother. It's all about the fetus. It's all about the baby. And all these hormonal changes are designed to get that baby to a certain point of viability and to be born. So those hormonal changes from everything from estrogen, progesterone, androgens, all these hormones make changes in the women that suddenly make them feel a little dispossessed from their body, sometimes their mind also, but you are gaining weight. All of a sudden, you're told that you can't exercise in the certain way you used to exercise. Maybe you have to stop working so hard, you can't travel. You have nutritional restrictions on you. You have um, physical restrictions on you, let alone all these hormonal changes that are causing disruptions in your sleep pattern, in the way you're walking, in the way you're talking. And suddenly, a woman who used to be in total control of her life is not. And I think it's a lesson in humility because you have to learn at that point during your pregnancy that life is not going to be A, B, C. You have to be flexible. You have to be open-minded. You have to not lose your sense of humor. I think these are all lessons that are getting you ready for parenthood. That once you're a parent, you have to be this way also. And the hormonal changes continue once you have that baby. And suddenly the excitement the fear, all of the information that you learned goes into this childbirth. It's a miracle, but it's also an incredible marathon. Whether you have a normal vaginal birth, it's going to hurt. If you have a C-section, it's going to hurt. There's some disappointments. Why did I have a C-section? Why couldn't I have done it naturally? Well, I tell my patients from the first day they're in my office, it's all about outcome. You want a healthy mom, healthy baby. Who cares about the method? There's no right or wrong here. You want to get to a healthy childbirth. You get the childbirth, everything is happy, everything is wonderful, and then what happens? Within 48 hours, estrogen plummets down. The progesterone plummets down. All these hormonal changes start all over again, another transition. 
And for a lot of women, this is a very difficult transition. It's physical, it's anatomical, it's chemical, it's also psychological. And they're all intertwined. These hormonal changes can give you hot flashes. They can make you feel anxious. They can make you feel depressed. They can make you feel not yourself once again. So all these transitions start all over again. And unless your doctor is going to be aware and alert to these subtle things and sometimes not so subtle things, you have suddenly a woman who used to be in total control of her life and now she has to deal with sleep deprivation, and physical deprivation and giving more of herself to this poor child who can't do anything for him or herself. And as a result, it can take a toll. And we're not talking about spoiled women. We're not talking about women who had it all and now have to be a parent. This can go from the range of a working person to a person who's home full time with their child and every gamut in between. So this is the transitions that we have to face and be alert to and sort of listen to all the signs and symptoms. Can you tell us what postpartum depression is? Because sometimes people don't understand it and what exactly the women experience or that you've seen. Yeah, in 26 years of practice you see a lot. But the bottom line is it's something that's quite, quite common up to 80%, 80% of women can go through some sort of postpartum depression. And it could be anything from feeling absolutely isolated and alone and not wanting to take care of your baby, not wanting to take care of yourself. That's the extreme. To even mild things like not being able to sleep, not thinking straight, not being able to finish a task. So if you don't have someone to talk to, if you don't have someone to approach it, you feel very isolated and alone, and of course, then things can spiral out of control. Can you tell us a little bit about access of care and how, what mechanisms that you currently have or before Seleni um, put everything under one roof? Tell us a little bit about access of care and how do you refer these patients? Well, I think that's one of the things that has been sorely lacking. First of all, you have to have a doctor who listens or asks the right questions. If you don't have a doctor who listens or asks the right questions, you're stuck. Then, of course, your doctor has to be able to refer. You know very well that all doctors can't do everything for every patient. So you have to know who to call to make those decisions if the patient needs medication, counseling. We're going to move on, and uh, now we're going to talk a little bit um, to the founder, Nitsia uh, Lobotetis, as a psychotherapist in practice for many years with a lot of experience who has children. If she can just tell us a little bit of what she's seen and what types of situations uh, she's experienced with patients that inspired her to uh, undertake such a monumental task. So I'd just like to start off by saying that as women, we are actually more vulnerable to psychological difficulties. We're three times as likely as men to suffer from depression and twice as likely to suffer from anxiety at some point in our lives. Throw in a baby, throw in being in an individualistic culture that doesn't support women sufficiently, plus an urban environment and you have the perfect storm for a postpartum depression. Mothers aren't adequately supported, and so we tend to see these mummy wars. This, did you deliver vaginally or did you deliver um, um, with a C-section? Are you breastfeeding or are you not breastfeeding? Are you co-sleeping or are you not co-sleeping? So women get stuck in these um, arguments with one another um, because they're just they're, it's their way of understanding and, and measuring how they are as parents. Because it's a difficult time, you're learning new skills. Ellen, have you seen this competitive mommy war in your practice? I never called it mommy wars, but I guess it is. I mean, it starts beforehand about who's the best doctor, what's the best hospital. I mean, I think we're in a bit of a cocoon, especially in New York City. But the fact is they all want the best for themselves and their child. Once the baby's born, as Nitya was saying, these are many, many educated women, or even the high school graduates who are working as assistants to the CEOs, they still have 
that edge that they want the best for their child. And if you don't have an outlet to talk about it, you're ending up competing. And it's not a healthy thing. Um, you see it especially with breastfeeding because you have the cultural saying, you should breastfeed now, it's best for your baby. You have the medical establishment, you have to breastfeed because it's the best for the baby. You have uh, the city, Mayor Bloomberg has said, it's the best thing to do to breastfeed your baby. And what if you don't want to breastfeed your baby or can't or feel guilty about the fact that you have to go to back to work in four weeks and you can't pump your breasts? Then it leads to anxiety. It leads to guilt. It leads to feelings of inadequacy. And a lot of women internalize it. And instead of seeking help or speaking up about it, they internalize it and matters get worse. But I would also say most people are very ashamed of coming forward and this saying that they're problem. suffering because it's supposed to be the time of your life when you're the happiest. It's supposed to well, that's how it's portrayed. And sometimes it's not. And quite often women just think they're tired and that's why they're feeling so low. Right. They don't attribute it to possibly a baby blues or postpartum depression. That's, that's right. where we come in. That's right. Because it can be a gamut, something mild, something severe. And it can, I think what we recognize a lot of the time, you're speaking about the, uh, the physical part that's going on with a woman, but also what we are really experiencing a lot as clinicians is seeing the complete overwhelm that the mother is experiencing a lot of the time, the trying to do so much, and the loneliness that comes along with that, and that is just further encouraging pulling back and hiding away and isolating and not being able to reach out for help. So we're really trying to create a... a a, a zone where it's comfortable to ask for help and change in the community message of asking for help. So, uh, Andrew, we're going to ask you to, uh, if you can tell us a little bit uh, about what we can do as friends and family to be uh, truly supportive. And before I say that, I just want to say Andrew Stephanopoulos uh, has extensive experience as a family therapist, and his credentials are take too long to read. He's worked everywhere and worked with all kinds of family therapy situations. So we'd like to uh, have him address really what we can do as family and friends to be truly supportive and in certain cultures like Nitsia was saying there's a certain stigma associated with oh there's nothing wrong with me I'm fine I'm not going anywhere mm -hmm. and what can we do as friends and family to help encourage people to seek out the help that they need well again as I was saying I think that's what we're, we've become very aware of is that creating a culture where it's okay to ask for help where it's okay to reach out and as Nitsia was saying as Dr. Manis was saying it's, it's, it can be very difficult sometimes. What we want to really encourage and push is that we're helping not only the family, but healthcare professionals of all sorts, nannies, daycare workers, teachers, to start to recognize a little bit more with the mother when they're seeing them in distress of how they can help. The times have changed a lot, as we know. We don't really live in a village type of society anymore. Uh, it used to be even, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to remember that I used to have my yaya around, I used to have my papu around, my, my uncles, my aunts, who could help us all. And if a mother was struggling, if, our, if a young mother was struggling, they could identify that and they could be there for them. And they could hear the baby struggling. And then they could, they could go and they could support them. But right now, as Dr. Manos was saying, as Nitsi was saying, when young women are coming to big cities, it's so fragmented. They're so out of touch in so many ways. Who do they turn to when they're really having a difficult time? It can be an incredibly lonely experience to live in a city, as I think everyone here would, would acknowledge, that here you're surrounded by millions of people, but yet you're so alone in everything that you do. And when you're feeling that way and feeling that you're struggling with your baby, that you're not really connecting to your baby, you're not attached to your baby, in some ways you just don't really want the baby around. How can you admit that? How can you acknowledge that? And I think what we're really trying to do as part of Seleni is not only help the mother, but as I said, help the community, the healthcare professionals, uh, understand that they need to ask the right questions. And the family needs to identify and see what's going on and not be uncomfortable asking questions to the mother who they see is struggling. And I think what we need to look for, if I could get, jump to that point, if you really do see your wife, if you do see your daughter, if you see your, your niece, whoever it might be struggling, look for signs of are they acting like themselves? Is something different about them? Are they not really feeling the joy, feeling the love, 
um, of wanting to be around the baby, do they seem confused a lot of the time? Brain fog is something that happens quite a bit in these situations where mothers who have been able to multitask very easily in the past all of a sudden can't quite put everything together. They're, they're stumbling over themselves. They don't know how, what to focus on in the morning. That brain fog and confusion is a very big sign that something else could be going on. Are they crying all the time? Um, are they not really being able to take care of themselves the way they used to? Uh, do they seem worried or detached, again, regarding the baby? Something we're really looking for when it comes to postpartum depression and struggling is what we call scary thoughts. Are the mothers really having scary thoughts about the baby, that they're either going to harm the baby or the baby is going to be in danger in some way? That if they hold the baby, they're going to drop the baby. Something very scary is going to happen. That is for us when we're really evaluating somebody, one of the first signs that this could be beyond baby blues. This could be beyond sort of a typical depression or overwhelm. So we want to be really conscious and aware, and if you're noticing it as family members, that the mother is really either able to express some of these scary thoughts or you, you seem to identify that they might be having them. That's something to pay attention to uh, very importantly. Do they seem attentive or concerned about the baby's health? That's always very important. Um, and this is a strange one, but are they having trouble sleeping? You would think that a mother is exhausted, would not be able to want anything more than to sleep all the time. But actually, one thing that we're looking for all the time is insomnia. Are they really not able to sleep when they should be sleeping as much as they're sleeping? Um, and are they having panic attacks? Are they, if you can identify that they're acting out of character and overwhelmed with anxiety, overwhelmed with panic, that's something we tend to look for as well. Um, one final thing I'll say as far as that is also, you know, listen to them as well. Are they just saying that they are blaming themselves for a lot of family problems? Are they scared that the husband, the family members, are not going to want to hear them talk about this issue in any way? When you start to hear a combination of all these different fears, all these different anxieties, all these different scary thoughts together, that's what we're looking for as clinicians. And as family members, as people in the community, I would encourage you to, to pay attention to that, to not get overwhelmed and frightened uh, and get in a panic yourself, but to patiently and calmly listen to what's going on with the mother and try to be with them as much as possible. But when you start to hear that there's a combination of a lot of these different issues going on, to reach out to a clinician of some sort, to reach out to somebody who you feel is a professional in the field, to reach out to people at Seleni, to different resources that we can provide that can really help get the person the help that they need. But one thing I would also encourage is don't do it behind their back. Don't, don't do it as though you're shaming them more and making them an object of more um, worry and concern. Be honest with them. Be forthcoming. Express to the, them that you want to help them and that you want to reach out to them. And then it can make them hopefully feel a bit more comfortable and come in and get the help that they may need at that point. And the other thing I want to add is it's also an appeal to the person who's suffering that this is not only to help you, but it's going to help your family unit. It's going to help your baby if you get help. If you feel better, you're going to support your baby better. There's medical literature that shows that children of depressed parents or depressed mothers especially don't do as well. They don't meet their goals, their cognitive goals. They don't meet their motor skills. They're a little delayed when the mother is severely depressed. And again, we're not just talking about the severely depressed mother, but when that happens, it's important to pick it up and appeal to the mom and say, it's not just for you, it's also for your family unit. The baby's going to do better, your family's going to do better. And this sometimes works very well because they feel, again, in control, I'm going to help myself and my family. So that's an important way to approach it. I'd like to move on to uh, ask Nitsia about, as a psychotherapist in practice, what gaps did she <coughs> see in the care of women and uh, how Seleni is addressing some of these gaps? So the, the only thing I saw as a psychotherapist was just this feeling of alienation and isolation. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, you know, if you are a mother-to-be or a mother in, in an urban environment in the US, um, you know, 40 years ago or 30 years ago, you would have had your mother, your aunt, your sister in the room helping you after the baby was born, um, maybe helping you to breastfeed the baby more easily, 
maybe sort of taking the load off you by doing the laundry. But the, the reality is that for, a, for an American woman in, a, in an urban environment, at best her parents are around for maybe a week and then everybody goes home and their husband goes back to work after a sort of one or two week paternity leave. And then mom is left alone at home to her own devices and she's, she doesn't have the skills yet. It takes time to develop them. Um, so, you know, women are very alone. And what we wanted to do with Seleni is to recreate a village atmosphere and offer as many services as we could to really help these women who are vulnerable. So, for example, we offer um, breastfeeding um, consultancy at, at Seleni. We offer parenting classes. We offer sleep, um, sleep training, uh, psychotherapy, psychiatry, support groups so that we can reach women where, where they are. Your friends and family know when there's a new baby arriving and what would you advise them? Well, I think that it's perfectly uh, understandable to be intimidated, to be nervous, to be scared. These are all things that are normal when you're in a situation you're not used to. Uh, and most of the time, you can get over these sort of obstacles by talking to your husband and talking to your best friend. I was the last one in my family, my extended family, to have a baby. So I had all the knowledge of my sister-in-laws who did a great job with their kids, for the most part. Uh, they did. And I would, ask them, I would ask them questions. I was able to talk to the, to the people who went through it. So for most people who have a bit of an extended family, or certainly an understanding spouse, the little obstacles and kinks along the way get worked out. And that's perfectly normal. But then, you have to go one step farther. If you don't have the support, then you have to think about being honest with yourself and with your doctors. Again, I go back to it. Whether it's a healthcare provider, whether it's a nurse practitioner, whether it's a doctor, it's somebody who has to listen and catch these things early and be able to refer them. So again, it's all about communication. It's a matter of speaking up and if you can't, a family member or a friend can talk with you and encourage you to seek the help. And I think it's very, very important that the joy of it is there. We know that. The joy of it is going to be continuing, but sometimes you can't get to that point of joy quite yet. Okay, now, I'm a woman with postpartum depression. I show up at the doorstep of Seleni. Could you just take me through it? How does it work? How do I register? Absolutely. How do yeah. I... What we want to do at Seleni, uh, what Nitzia has, has created is, is a model whereby we have a range of clinicians coming from all theoretical disciplines, coming from a psychoanalytical background, a cognitive behavioral background, a range of all different theoretical disciplines. So when a woman would come to us, or a family member would come to us, they would first meet with myself in a first initial, we don't want to quite call it an intake, but evaluation first session, where it can really get a sense of what's going on with the mother, uh, what's going on with the family, a little bit about their history, both psychological, psychiatric history, as well as their medical history, as we were talking about earlier. Sometimes there might be something medically, be it a thyroid or hyperthyroid issue that's going on, that could really be making the depression much worse than necessarily that it's all not emotional, it could be organic in some form. And to really get a sense of has the mother at that point gotten the proper examinations and medical uh, reviews to really understand is there something else going on before there's an emotional issue going on. If we carry on to that point, we, again, through that evaluation, through that talk, we get a sense of what they really need, what type of therapist they really need to be with. Do they need individual therapy? Do they need support groups? Do they need some other sort of care? But once we determine, let's say, that they need individual therapy, we would choose, I would choose, together with the clinical team, which therapist on our staff would be best to meet with them. Is it an issue that's more related to maybe not postpartum depression, but have they maybe lost a child? Have there, have there been multiple miscarriages or difficulty with their fertility cycles? Is it more that the mother is grieving necessarily than having postpartum depression? So there could be a range of issues that are going on with the mother, and again, I want to stress always, and with the family at that point as well. 
So we determine who the best therapist would be for the mother or the family at that point. And then they would continue on ongoing therapy, work out a treatment plan with the individual therapist for what care would be best for them as they follow through. But again, what is unique about Seleni, um, in, at least in an outpatient setting, what is very unique is we do collaborate as clinicians. It's not just one therapist working alone with no other support at all. We have daily clinical meetings where we review each client uh, that we have and we hear different points of view from all the different clinicians. So the therapists themselves are not isolated or alone in, in the experience, but they get the benefit of having the knowledge of all of what Seleni has to offer. Um, and we hope by having that collaboration, it makes the, the, not only the therapist better and more attentive and more attuned to what's going on with the client, but it helps the client feel even that much more supported and heard and understood in a lot of ways. I, I want to just mention one thing also. When you are pregnant and right after pregnancy, you are seeing doctors and providers so often. You're going every month, then you're going every two weeks, then you're going every week, then after the baby you come two weeks after C-section, six weeks after the baby. There is so much opportunity for things to be picked up at that point, whether it's from your nutritionist, from your doctor, from your you know, massage therapist. You know, everybody, if they just tune their ears a little bit to listen, things can be picked up. I think it's the most observed time of your life when you're pregnant and having a baby and right after. So it's a perfect time to pick up on things. Yeah, right. If I could just follow up on that for a second, as I was saying earlier, as we've been talking about, really reaching out to people like Dr. Manas and all the other OBGYNs and doctors in the area and really giving them a safe place to be able to turn to so they don't feel so alone. You can hear that word coming up consistently through through not only the mother's experience but also the clinician's experience. Overwhelm, isolation, alone. The more that we can support each other as a community and really create a very interconnected community, a village in a different form, the better served every mother and every family. Because part of the problem is that um, obstetricians, doctors, pediatricians are afraid to ask the questions because then what? Then where do they go? So now that we, there is a place for them to go, we're hoping it will be easier for them to ask those difficult questions. Also, I want to comment that I think a lot of women suffer in silence because there's also a legislative and insurance issue. The stigma associated, for example, with breast cancer getting mammograms, legislatures got involved and made insurance companies pay for mammograms as a mandatory thing. They would push mothers out when they deliver their babies, and through national legislation, Women can stay in the hospital now for a 20, at minimum a 24-hour period. You can't kick a woman out of the hospital. Emergency rooms, everyone gets uh, treatment no matter what. Why? Because a woman went to deliver a baby and a hospital turned her away. That's the Emergency Medical Transportation Labor Act, the EMTALA law. And that was because a woman was seeking out help. And one of the things that came to me as we're having this meeting is through legislative means, we should be pushing the HMOs and insurance companies to allow if women have to have the option that if they want to go to a therapist, a Seleni, or reach out and get help for postpartum depression, that it, it's mandatory that it would be paid by the HMO. Because right now, we've created this large body of what I call underinsured people, mm -hmm. and we'll go into that some more about the financial aspects and payment aspects when we get into our question and answer period. But think about that, that on a legislative level, how we should be pushing, just like they did for breast cancer, just like they did for women after deliveries, mandatory stays, that they have this sort of one or two or three or four visits that each state on a mandatory level can get access and they can choose to go and see Andrew or see Nitsia or go to Seleni. Well, if I could mention that as well, and, and for when we diagnose as clinicians, we are guided by the Diagnostic Science Manual, and in that manual, still, the new manual just came out after several, about two decades, I believe, just recently, and there is no specific diagnosis for postpartum depression. And that just speaks to that even at this point, how much education and how much growth we have in this field, it's still not 
I don't want to say respected, but not really honored the way it should be, then even from a clinical point of view, it doesn't have the proper coding that can get reimbursed for insurance and different issues. So that was the reason why I asked uh, Ellen to define it for us, because out of curiosity, I opened up my DSM, which is like the Bible for psychiatric diagnosis, and I'm saying, wow, this isn't here. And if you can't code it, guess what? The insurance company won't pay for it. So being through legislation by creating, pushing for a code, a diagnostic code, that would be very helpful as well. And if Nitzia can tell us um, other things she wants us to know about Seleni and its uh, structure, where it's located, and what's the, what's the best mechanism currently for referring a patient? Because there are a lot of physicians out here in the audience. We have the Chief of Vascular Surgery from Steinberg. We have a great new rheumatologist, Elaine Karras, in our community. We've got Dr. Whalen, we've got all kinds of uh, medical professionals here who would like to know a little bit more about what the mechanism is to get people to Selene. So, <laughs> do you want to take this question? Yeah, really I, I, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question and it, it's been a... Um, Pleasure. I, I'm Pleasure. going to say a challenging question for us uh, as well. Because how do we make the community, again, as we really speak about, know that, we're, that we are here, that other resources are available. And we're finding that it is by providing as much one-to-one, -one, really going out into the community as much as possible. But of course there are millions, or not millions, but thousands of providers. So we're really trying to create that awareness by offering workshops, by offering, by doing panels like this, by, by making it known that we exist, and I bet you can see even I'm stumbling over it because it's a challenging question of how to make people aware other than really knocking on doors one-on-one. -on -one. Um, well, what if a patient came and knocked on your door? Which they could just, we would uh, take them. We you would, would take, take them. We would, would speak to them and see if we were appropriate, that okay. we were the right, that we... So you don't were, necessarily need a referral. You don't need a referral. In that sense, yes. Now, if you're saying that way, it's not as though you only have to come in through a doctor's referral. Through our website, uh, which is very central to everything that uh, Seleni is, is about, is that outreach of providing awareness to the larger community, really on a national but international basis. We're having our clinicians as well as other um, doctors and writers write unique articles for us about these issues, anywhere from postpartum depression to bereavement to loss of all sorts. And by providing the website, any individual, if they're struggling at 3 o'clock in the morning, would, like most people would, Google and find out they, they're having something going on and be made aware of us, be it postpartum depression or grieving. And through the website, they can register to come in and request an appointment. They can call us directly. But it does not, to Dr. Madison's point, it does not have to be just a phone call, just a referral from a doctor. It's through the website, through face-to-face, -face, through individual people, friends, family, making others aware that we exist. We'll get the word out more and more and more. I think that answered it. You can also, I think, plant the seeds in medical students. We have Jimmy Wong here who's going to second year of medical school. When they do their obstetrics and gynecology at Mount Sinai, which is right there, or NYU, it could be a one day where a medical student can rotate and spend a day through Seleni, who's going into OBGYN. Mm -hmm. And that early education makes a tremendous difference, and that will stick with them, and they'll remember that. So that's a way to start planting those seeds and those trees for the future through medical student education and nursing education, of course. Because mm -hmm. that's the front line. Mm -hmm. So I'll take our first question. You can identify yourself and then pose the question, please. Microphone, Andrew. It's a microphone. We also have the a gentleman. The Greek National TV is over here tonight. So that's getting the word out, and the National Herald is here as well. Fantastic. Hi. I have three questions that usually follow one another. Where is Solani? We haven't heard that yet. Physically, where? We are on the Upper East Side of New York. Ah. We're at uh, the actual address is 207 East 94th Street, which is on the Upper East Side between 2nd and 3rd Avenues on East 94th Street. But the reason we haven't told you is because he'll be getting a goodie bag. And it's all that information and we didn't want to bore you during the tour. There's only one facility? One yes, facility. For now. No. Oh, no. Okay. And org uh, is the website, in case you have your smartphone, you can't wait for the goodie bag. <laughs> uh, what about, is it a pay-for-services clinic? Very good question. So in looking 
to establish Seleni, we decided that um, we would not accept insurance because the insurance plans for mental health are very poor and since there isn't a postpartum depression diagnosis in the DSM, nobody would get reimbursed. So what we do is um, we have a financial assistance program and we can provide up to 90% um, financial assistance for people who need it, but we do a means test on the foundation side and determine how much the potential client can pay. The New York State Department of Mental Health funds many of these programs, particularly for the teenage young girls who find themselves pregnant in indigent families. And are you associated with them in any way? Do you get funding from them? We do not receive any governmental funding for now. No. What do you do with the indigents who come to your door if they oh. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. The indigent. The indigent. Yes, what do you do with the indigent girls? We Young girls, them, no money. We treat pregnant. them just as everyone else. If they have a, a diagnosis for postpartum depression or if they have had several miscarriages and they suffer from infertility or if they have recently lost a child, we will, we will look after them, provided there is not something else going on. For example, if there's a drug if abuse. there's drug abuse or if there's a, a, a diagnosis for schizophrenia, we are not equipped to treat them. But we do not turn those girls away. Do you have some way you can refer them? Yes. Yes, you we do. do. We do. We have a big network of people we refer to. What, what what's really important to us is that we're really there to help the individual as much as possible. And if it's not with us, we want to make sure that they can be taken to a place that, that can refer them, that is appropriate for them, and that can maybe even give them many more services. Because you're saying with the indigent population, they may, may need many more services than we can really provide, such as case management service, other support services that another facility would be the best for them. So we want the help to in, the individual is our, pri is our priority. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question. Thank you. I just, I first wanted to say congratulations, I think. Um, what you're all done is amazing. I'm a father of two young children. My wife is pregnant with her third, and what you're doing is really amazing and incredible. And you've talked a lot about the present, a lot about the past, and where you've come. Itzy, in particular, your vision has created this really incredible place. What, what are your thoughts about the future in terms of where this is going to go? Do you see multiple, taking off that question, multiple facilities? What's, what's the plan? So, we've been talking a lot about stigma. Um, and I think I see our biggest role as um, reducing the stigma to seeking out help. I happen to be an enormous fan of Nancy Brinker and all she's done for breast cancer. 20 years ago, it was very shameful to even admit you had breast cancer. Today, people are practically opening their shirts. Um, I think this is absolutely wonderful and I would love it if um, Seleni was able to bring about some changes in the stigma from um, related to mental health. That would be my dream. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Cool. Cool. Uh, how did you pick the name? Uh, Seleni. Oh. So, what is it? The question is how did they pick the name Seleni? Good question. Good question. So when, when we were looking to find a name for Seleni, um, I phoned my dad, who happens to be very proud of his Greek heritage and um, an avid fan of etymology. And um, he's, I said to him, Dad, I really need um, a name that's related to our heritage, maybe a Greek goddess. So he came back a few days later and he said, I have it for you. And I said, what is it? And he goes, uh, Selene, the goddess of the moon. I said, hmm, I don't know if I like how that sounds. Um, and I'm not sure it quite captures everything. Um, I happen to be a very big fan of Eleni Gansoyanis, the book by Nicholas Gage. And um, I really felt that her courage represented something that women who come into therapy do. They need. They're very courageous when they come in to face their emotions. So I thought, let's combine Selene with, Sele with Eleni, and then it's Seleni. So it's really honoring women's courage as they face their emotions. Nice. Uh, any further questions? The young lady there on the right. <laughs> uh, I don't have a question, but I have a suggestion that you uh, get in touch with the National Blockhouse. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'm on the board, and uh, this is 
really up to their alleys. Yeah. So that you should uh, communicate. Yeah. Thank you. We've been we've been aware of that, and, and it's it's an uh, organization that yes, I mean I've been familiar with my whole life, obviously, and it's it's uh, you're absolutely right. It is the right type of organization that speaks to the needs of women in the not only in the Greek community but the the, the national community as well. So thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Uh, I do you plan down the road, since you're newly established in 2011, you're dealing with new mothers, mothers-to-be, as you can tell, I'm uh, a grandmother of five. Do you plan eventually, because if it's women's issues, what about the mother who has two children and she's a single mother and they're 10 and 11. We're, we're past postpartum, we're past breastfeeding, we're moving into a deal. What about uh, mothers who, uh, who have raised their children who have not been career oriented and now are empty nests? Right. So, you know, they, so are, do you plan eventually to... Well, let me just interject and say that tonight's talk we focused on transition to motherhood as an introduction to Seleni, but we actually treat a broad range of issues. Um, we help mothers in general. We don't just help women who are getting pregnant or have just had a baby. We, we treat women who are going through challenges. For example, we offer a workshop that's, um, that is called Supporting the Supporter and we deal with women who's, who have children with disabilities. So we do treat all sorts of issues related to motherhood. We have parenting experts who help mothers through challenging times as well, children with learning difficulties. To and, and I am hoping personally that they eventually um, become sufficient, self-sufficient enough and expanded enough to deal with perimenopause right. and issues of that yet another transition or even losing a spouse or having that kind of issue with an aging parent. So that it would be a truly broad-based psychological uh, safe house, so to speak, where you could go and seek treatment for those kind of things too. So that would be my hope as a physician to have another place to refer to. Thank you. We're going to wrap things up. I really want to thank uh, Andrew Stephanopoulos, our panelists, Dr. Ellen Manos, Itziono Gopetis, and our sponsor Kula Jonides for a wonderful evening.